and it's upended and defies all expectations. Just incredible. And then we also have Ferdinand King, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Ferdinand Kingsley with his oh, no, closer. Hello, I've killed you with my name. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, no. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about your involvement playing uh, playing uh, Hog Gatling. Um, well, I, uh, you know, like like most things in this profession, was just asked if I wanted to have a stab at auditioning, and thought, well, you know, I'll give that a go, and then I'll um, then I'll mump and grump when I don't get the part, but at least I'll get to say that I, I had a go, <laughs> and I can watch it going. Did you know I actually read a couple of those scenes before the rest of you saw it? Um, and then um, when they made the 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 mistake of saying I could have a go, it was just um, it's just glorious because it's the it's it's uh, uh, Sandman is something that's been present in our in our house since I was about well since I was way too young to read it about nine or ten because I've got an older brother who is an obsessive Sandman fan, um, and so when I um when I told him I was playing Hob, he immediately reeled off some of his speeches, yeah. well one of his speeches, notable speech from from well, from a bit later season of mists um and uh, and he had he had that speech written on the back of his guitar when he was a teenager um so i i and then i just get to 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 join quite late in the in the relatively late in the filming of the show and um it was a blast but it was weird because you don't i mean you turned up about the same time as me didn't you kirby i did it was, it yeah, was I think strange we had, oh. sort of rocking up them having done about 10 months already just, <laughs> this is gonna be fun isn't it absolutely um, uh, yeah but there's a kind of simplicity to our yeah there's going i know new kids at school there's kind <laughs> of um there's a simplicity in a way to to uh this episode which i nearly just egotistically called our episode um the episode which we're which we're in um it's which your episode that, <laughs> yeah thank you Thanks, i Neil. took the I didn't want to recording say it, you saying that Neil. Yeah. <laughs> um but there's a kind of simplicity to it, which is glorious for us to sort of step into a world. I mean, I got to step into a world where this is a guy who literally who does not have a clue what's going on. So you're on the ride with him. And that's kind of how I spend a lot of my days anyway. So it was, uh, it was great. Well, th in this particular episode, Vanity Fair called it uh, the perfect hour. The best of the comic in a single standalone episode why do you think uh the, aside from the great humor in this episode what 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 uh what makes it stand out to you and what were your challenges particularly for uh for for neil and and uh, uh alan and david in in uh approaching it. I mean, I, I just don't know what your work process is like. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I guess I got to interact with this episode first because I got to write Sandman episode eight and Sandman episode 30, 13, uh, about 34, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, there was a particular strangeness and beauty to seeing <clears throat> those episodes, those issues of the comics that I wrote, translated um, incredibly gracefully onto the screen and incredibly faithfully. Uh, but I remember right at the beginning, uh, the very first conversation that, that David and Alan and I had together we were talking about the fact we're going to set it in 2022. We're going to start in 2022. So what are we going to do with Hob? Because we're not going to change him from being in all those lovely 89s. It's still going to be 1389, 1489, 1589. We don't want to change it to 22s all the way. Um, but if we're going to do that, then, then what happens? And how do we figure it out? And I remember some of it seems only to come well less right at the end. Alan and I were talking a lot on, on Zoom and on the phone and 
and um, and then the conversation that he has with the man in the pub, the barman or the publican, um, <laughs> you know, that gave us beauty. Uh, and I think the other thing that was a wonderful, <clears throat> you know, literally a stroke of genius, and I do not know whose idea it was, I suspect it came out of the writer's room, but Alan can enlighten us, um, was whose idea it was to back-to-back mm. episodes six, uh, episodes eight and 13 to make episode six. They really Alan. talk to each other, don't they? They speak to each other, the two yeah. issues. They become a conversation. They do. Yeah. Um, and they tell us so much about dream and about life and about death which always, for me, was the important, the most important thing about, about death is she is also life. Mm-hmm. She bounds. She bounds mm-hmm. and shapes life. And uh, here we have a story that's absolutely about death and then absolutely about life. And it becomes one big thing. And, it, and we get to tackle topics that ought to be much too big for regular television. Uh, episodic, you know, drama fantasy, and we get to do it. And somehow, uh, Alan and his team of geniuses, I really feel, have pulled it off. That's very kind. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, I should start by saying that Tom Sturridge, who plays Dream of the Endless on The Sandman, uh, is wishing that he could be with us right now, but he is in a secluded area uh, with no Wi-Fi. So... Um, that's about the dream. Rest. Sorry, a very, that's a very heard. Morpheus yeah. move. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Don't you think? Just yeah. sending a carrier pigeon to send us some messages. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a raven, a raven or something. Not a yes. carrier pigeon. A raven. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um, well, uh, just to, to to elaborate a little bit on what Neil on what Neil was saying, um, this was this was sort of an ongoing process. We had a lot of different versions of this. We definitely, you know, because. We promised Netflix we'd deliver 45 minute episodes. We knew that expanding Sound of Her Wings to fill 45 minutes wasn't going to work. And the same with Men of Good Fortune. And so we started to have the conversation about how it really is, especially the way we sort of reframed what death says to dream in the course of it and and allowing death to sort of invoke Hob. And we really focused it on the way dream does his job. and, and you know the way that death sort of setting an example by knowing everyone's name and everything about them and making contact and touching them and eye contact and dreams being sort of above it all when he does his job that his relationship with Hob is really what she's leading him to mm-hmm. so um there was a lot of debate about putting the two stories together there was a version that we shut down pretty quickly neil will remember where we intercut between the two stories that didn't work at all. Um, And then I was very happy because we had a, by the time I got to London for prep, we had the script of 106 and I thought, I've arrived with six out of the 11 scripts and you know, we can do this only to find out that in England, you only have daylight starting in April and May. So that we, and we, we were going to start shooting in November. So they've like shunted episode six to the end of the schedule. And suddenly I have one less script to shoot. So uh, it gave us time to refine uh, episode six. And once we cast the two of you, it gave us time to, Really, at Ferdy, we, 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 no. <laughs> we got the chance to sit down with Ferdy in a room and like work on the script with with Ferdy and Tom and with our director Mirzi Almas, uh, and the script improved a great deal because of that work that we did, and we did something similar with Kirby as well um, via Zoom, as I recall. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So there that's was, the sort of. Am I remembering scenes. right? I hope it's okay to to say this, but was there there was a brief time, was there, where it was sort of semi-considered as being one of the standalone episodes at the end. But it, it to me, it we makes had... so much sense that it's the sort of fulcrum point of the series, that it's a, it's a sort of calm after one of the storms and before, before the other. We, was... we had... oh, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, some of the initial work that happened was Alan and I <clears throat> visited Neil in New York for a few days. And that's where... Um, some of the sort of the early like how are we going to do this and i will say one thing i remember from those few days is even though men of good fortune happens a little later um in the chronology uh 
it's if you think about dreams character arc it's 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 an aloof being who learns how to be human and learns how to love and it just felt we there were in that conversation we were we were wondering if we could figure out a way to get it into the meat of the first season because of that and and also because death you know plays a part in men of good fortune mm-hmm. but go ahead alan no, no, no. I was just going to say, I it, it, it I remember from, at least from the time when we convened the writer's room, uh, we knew that the death part of the story was always going to be 106, and it was the Hobbes story that was a floater yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but then, you know, it did flow out of a discussion in the writer's room in terms of what are those two stories about, if we're looking at it specifically uh, through the lens of Dream's arc. And they both seem to be saying something similar to him so we just made it the same episode can i can i ask a um a sort of fanish question neil yes that um (laughs) hi um that back back when you were writing these two editions these two issues what was there a particular spark that made you want to you know explore these sides of dream or or these sides of humanity or the human experience that just made you go right that's that's the story i want to tell in these two um the idea of two people meeting in a pub every hundred years might well have been the oldest story idea i'd ever had i mean i remember being literally at school and just having this idea of two people meeting every century and not knowing what it was, not knowing what to do with it, not knowing where it went or who the people were, but just going, this is, this is a real idea, and I, and I think it's something. So that was free-floating in my head. Um, with death, uh, the, I loved the idea. I thought, you know, the, the one thing that I'd never seen in any quest story is that the letdown at the end. Um, and for me, one of the the things that you learn about life is you go, I will go off and do this amazing thing. I will, I will slay the dragon and win the princess. And you go out there and you spend your time slaying the dragon and winning the princess or possibly slaying the princess and winning the dragon. Um, but whatever you do... It, it's a big thing, and you do it, and then it's over, and you look around and go, "Well, what do I, what do I do now? What happens now? What, mm. what was that for? What, what did that mean?" And I thought, I've never seen that in comics, mm. and I just wanted, I wanted to let Dream have that moment, um, and I also knew that I had death, and I wanted to meet her, and I thought, well, we'll have gone on this giant quest. Um, for his stuff, and we will have gone to hell, and we will have gone, you know, literally to hell and back. Wouldn't it be nice just to have a story where he meets his sister and they walk around and they talk a bit and he cheers up? <laughs> and it seemed, um, and nothing exciting, exciting needs to happen. <laughs> nothing, no, nobody gets, you know, there's no attacks foiled, there's no. <laughs> story of this that is the story they're gonna meet it's it's an episode about connection isn't it really absolutely it is it's absolutely about connection it's absolutely about family it's it's also about somebody telling you to get over yourself (laughs) um and one of the things that i love that alan um and and his team came up with was the idea of folding a short death story that I'd written called Winter's Tale, um, which is the one where she just basically, it, it's, it was a story I wrote for a wonderful artist uh, called Jeffrey Catherine Jones, a, this astounding trans artist of incredible brilliance. Um, and I asked, I, I, and I just wrote a story where Death walks around talking to us and just saying, I used to be, you know, I used to be kind of miserable. I used to be awful. I, this is how, this is how I learned to come to terms with who I am and what I am. And I learned to love my job 
and to appreciate my job. And I love that big chunks of that were used in the middle. So it gives Kirby something bigger and chewier to say. She, so I, I think both of those things were hugely important for me. Um, but the other thing that I love about writing yours, and then probably soon we should actually start a watch party, <laughs> is, um, is the joy I took. I had an artist uh, named Michael Zully drawing Men of Good Fortune. And for me, the biggest delight in having Michael doing Men of Good Fortune was I sent him piles and piles of reference works on costume through the ages, architecture through the ages. We, and because I knew that in order for the story to work, it had to be set in specific times at specific moments. It couldn't be set in that sort of amorphous area of comics known as the past or historical. <laughs> It couldn't be just sort of vaguely set in times gone by. It had to be very specific. And I knew I needed an artist who could land that. And Michael, Michael really did, and he landed it so beautifully. Well, I'm being told that it's time to watch the episode. And by the way, death is always such a foreboding, ominous concept and for you to create a death that brings comfort at pivotal times, uh, it, I think the, it, a perfect example of how innovative this show is on every level. I've never seen anything like it. I, I mean, uh, it, it, in my view, it's an absolute masterpiece. And uh, like I say, uh, I'm being told it's time to... <laughs> Watch episode six, The Sound of Her Wings. So I'm going to stay quiet, but I would love for any of you uh, creatives to annotate or jump in and comment as you will. So it's an especially unique viewing experience. So with that in mind, let's have a look at episode six. The sound Yay. of her wings. I need myself now. <sighs> I think people were more concerned about that loaf of bread and whether it was going to get oh into the show. Oh, my goodness. Than anything else. And whether it was going to hit Tom in the head as it did in the I love this. I, Alan, I don't know if you remember, a lot of it was like, we worked, talked so much about like the approach and like, you know, like approaching and there being this moment where you didn't know, if you knew, you knew, if there were siblings, if you didn't, you, you know, it's the first time you've ever seen these two people interact and you don't know that they're brother and sister. That's the thing is in the comics, it's a reveal. And we wanted yeah. to sort of, we wanted to keep that aspect of it. I remember that little girl running across pigeons shot after shot after shot, and they just wouldn't get out of her way. Stoic. Those pigeons are trained. They would not move. They're they paid more than me, pigeons. I think. <laughs> but the girl running through the pigeons is important.
I watched this with my 15 year old who had never read the comics and he was assuming death was going to be a villain in the show. And he was, his mind was blown when this moment happened and even more blown when he realized desire was a villain. He just assumed. Yeah. Yeah. Which I really love because in our world, we do paint death as a villain, but then, you know, desire is so layered, right? With desire comes, you get jealousy, you get anger, you get possession and all this. And they don't think those are things you normally think about. If you were to say like, yeah. you know, what's, what, what do we fear more? It's always going to be death. Yeah. For those of us who read the books, we of course knew the character you were right. playing was this benevolent sweet character but it was a real revelation for my 15 year old yeah i love that that's lovely it's a very western thing isn't it the way that we're scared and we make death the baddie absolutely it feels like a sort of quietly revolutionary thing to make her just the most natural part of the human existence is yeah you know we're all going to meet her at some point. So why does she have to be a villain? It's a very, um, it's a very Western thing. I think that we're, that we try and get as far away from her as possible. (laughs) I loved saying this. Excuse for an <laughs> you have no idea how many actresses could not say that line. <laughs> we saw so many, many, many failed so many. auditions that just sank yeah. on those rocks. That's the line that will say with me. They were gone. It'll stay with me forever. You know how actors can quote things from early. That that's that line. Yeah. I will be able to quote that line forever, happily. Thanks. Was this one of the scenes you had to audition with? Yeah, the the I did that myself. That's what got me the role. I could catch the ball like that. <laughs> <laughs> Al, Alan, does Tom have a Morbius voice like Christian Bale has a Batman voice? Does he? Does he become? How different is Morbius from Tom's cadence and voice? Completely. I mean, obviously he's got it in him, but it's not yeah. his conversational. Yeah. And and you know, as Neil has so, uh, Tom has said, Sturridge is twelve. Yeah. Tom, Tom is the oldest twelve-year-old. <laughs> no, I know. I know. I know. But it's he's excited. Funny he's he really. And he's yeah. soft. Yeah. He he reigns it all much in. Much quicker than this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he but talks also, quickly for start. What, what's lovely was actually because Tom takes his time because and and it feels like no, you know, Morpheus can't be rushed. I think it allows you, you as an actor when you're working alongside him to take a moment and let the material breathe and live in it Absolutely. a lot more. And I really yeah, appreciate space, that. Doesn't he? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my goodness, I ate so many apples this day, I can't <laughs> tell well, you. <laughs> I was going to say. Wait till we get there? to the chicken eating yeah. scene for me. Oh, there was laryngitis to contend with as well. Yes, oh, absolutely. So uh, I lost my voice. I mean, I couldn't even do the yeah, rehearsal yeah, the day yeah. before. My, I was, I could barely speak. It was so raspy and I was just pushing. I mean, it was just non-stop tea pushing to try and even be heard in this scene but i liked it it did get it was beautiful it gave it this yeah i like the rasp i've never lost my voice as well fun fact i've never in my whole life lost my voice and the day before we started shooting i never <laughs> I, what i don't know how the excitement and stress and and it all sort of manifested because i don't know that i was feeling any of it but i think you know it's so rare that you're familiar with something for so many years of your life before you actually play that role. And I think my body internalized it and said, all right, no voice. There's some plot, a little bit of plot. Yeah. Just tossed in there. Season two, we will learn more. My kids keep asking who the prodigal (laughs) is and I won't tell them. Good. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> I love that moment. It, in, in a lot of ways, it's the first point in the whole of the show so far that Tom kind of unbends. Yeah. It just sort of just relaxes. And he yeah, hasn't and relaxed it ha- yeah. until... Yeah. It happened so naturally as well. We were walking and we were, we kind of were walking so close. We had to walk, yeah. it's sort of like a, a catwalk almost, you know, it's pretty tight. And we kind of, you keep bumping because you're so close. And it just sort of made sense to go like, it's almost like a three legged race. You have to work in unison if it's going to work. Like you can't be in your own, on your own path. It's like we get there together. Yeah. Well, and no one touches Tom all season until Kirby touches yeah. Tom. Yeah, I was thinking that. I remember telling you that when you and David came out. Nobody touches him. Yeah. He was wonderful. This scene made me cry. And oh, that my goodness. astonished me. I thought, I, I, you know, I wrote this. I wrote this thing three decades ago. How can I be crying? But the first time I saw a rough cut of the episode, I sat there in New Zealand and... Uh, and sniffled my way through it. So beautiful. <laughs> I was close to all day shooting the scene, yeah. <clears throat> it was almost like a play as well because we shot in order. We did that walk down the canal and then that building was actually there and we went inside. It was, yeah, it was immersive. My parents used to live next to that building. Oh, really? It's beautiful. I'd never been, I've been living in London my whole life and I'd never been, I've been to Hammersmith so many times, but I'd never been to that spot. And it's magic, isn't it? It's gorgeous. It's magic. It's magic. Actually, I think some of the magic of this episode actually is uh, because it's so still, you're able to take in so many other things. I feel like the sunlight as well is so beautiful. It's. There's barely any CGI, really, in this episode, is there? Also, it's quite lovely to hear you speak, Alan, about the what would normally be like... It, what, I'm sure at first was an inconvenience when it came to filming, but actually what we got was one of the most glorious summers in London I've ever had. And it really found a way... It kind of We kind of absorbed the summer in our performance, I think, Tom and I. We, we literally got to walk and talk and enjoy life for the, you know, for the weeks that we filmed this. It was, yeah. We also yeah. traded New York City for London in our mm. adaptation. And I was sad at first because it's so iconic in the comic being in Washington Square Park, but it felt so redemptive for Dream's yeah, relationship with London to, to London treated him so poorly in the first episode. And this just felt so loving, just an embrace. Yeah. yeah. I even think tonally, the way it's Absolutely. shot, it's so much warmer than a lot of, of what's, especially than five. I mean, five is cold and dark. And then yeah, you come the, into this. And color, the color palette's totally the different. The color palette yeah. is completely, yeah, there's, it's warm and, and, I mean, yeah. Look at that place. <laughs> Occasionally I get people grumbling that you're not walking through New York and Washington Square. And I point out to them that walking through New York might have been difficult in a pandemic <laughs> and getting to New York might have been difficult in a pandemic. It definitely was. So really, mm. London's all right. London is where we could go. And it's the same story anyway. <laughs> yeah, it'll do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I always thought that was so wonderful that she says she, that, you know, when he says... He talks about the fact that they captured him, but they were trying to capture death. And she says, I know. And similarly to when death, you know, when she takes someone, she says, you know, now you'll find out there's this, um, she has this restraint. She doesn't need to explain everything. And it's sort of, things are what they are. And we can't change that anyway. And so that that's, I guess that was how it was all meant to be. I wish I had so that kind vastly of vastly powerful. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess for I, you, for death, is, like the huge, the huge moments just are what they are, aren't they? Yeah. But it also answers this sort of fan question of like, well, if Roderick Burgess died down there, 
didn't death appear to take Roderick Burgess? And if so, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, why didn't, of why didn't she death did. help? And, yeah. and she was there for Jessamy, and she was there yeah. for every little spider and beetle that died. Yeah, yeah she was there. In that cellar and, and mouse and all, man. as well. Yeah. yeah. But, but Neil, you just encapsulated it with her just saying, I know. I know. You know, yeah. perfect. She no knew. backstory, no explanation. So this death we invented for the show, and it was the writer of this episode, Lauren Bellows, idea. It came from a, a moment in her uh, in her life and experience. Um, uh, just to give a shout out to Lauren. The moment where he says all all my information, uh, all offline information, is on my phone. I mean, th I've, I, this is probably the most thought provoking work. I, probably it is that I've ever done but there were so many things that you would just sit and think about and yeah if it just ha if yeah. it, if you go like that yeah. there's so much unfinished business yeah that little detail is pure lore oh, too it's devastating yeah there's so much admin involved in death isn't there absolutely yeah. and even if it seems like your time or you're ready you know which yeah, we, then exploring the Hob Gadlin when was. you know there's never enough time So this is where we tried to lay in some of the Hob stuff. Foreshadowing, your guide to quality mm -hmm. literature. The mention of Mad Hattie <laughs> is brilliant as well, because Claire is. <clears throat> I want to see more Mad Hattie. We have Me to too. We have to make death the high cost of living just so Claire Higgins so do I. Yeah. And, not and least because she's one of not step least into the starlight. Because she's just one of our, our great actresses just being a maddo. She is. And yeah. she and I share a birthday, which is also a very wow. important reason. So this we is what we lifted from Winter's Edge. There used to be more of this from the Winter's Edge story, and uh, we ended up being long, so some of it will, will forever be unaired, but Kirby did it beautifully. It's interesting, actually, because I don't really always, I don't even, I don't think I noticed what, what was cut, and I think that's testament to how well this whole thing works. And speaking <clears throat> of the two episodes, you know, I, I was under the impression when I, came on board that this was two separate episodes and then seeing them together it's so seamless and yeah. i get excited about the hob gadling story actually yeah. like seeing this this is sort of like the setup for it kevin there's something you're about to do i don't want to like wreck it but when you <laughs> just say that's all you get I, it just does me it's um oh it ruined me when i read it in the comics and it's it's the simplicity of her compassion is, it's completely heartbreaking. I was convinced this wouldn't be in the show. I knew this, this was such a heartbreaking moment in the comic. I was convinced this wouldn't, this wouldn't be in. And actually it was something I had to wrap my head around and find my way into it. And Well, the mother's horrible scream in the comics yeah, was- There's an ache and feel when I watch this bit that feels like, yeah. We went back and forth on the, uh on the screen and then obviously it was just too much for anybody mm. to bear. And obviously in the comic, the baby says it and then but in this <laughs> one it's true. me, you know, I'm <laughs> sort of, I'm taking a line. We had a brief, we that one right. We, we had a brief where we yeah. were talking There's about so show There's so many tiny realizations in this, in this episode. I find that like, yeah. I find that the, the tiny moments of um, realizing stuff in this episode is, is cause some sort of drama in this episode. This is one of the very few places where we kind of get some Tom Sturridge captions creeping out into the world. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Yeah, this is a really beautiful montage. I think that's, for me, it's the most important thing. It's just the idea that when you go, whoever you are, wherever you are, however you go, there's a kind face. There's mm. somebody there just to hold your hand. Be a psychopomp. Mm-hmm. And take you. And greet you. And these actors who have no lines, they all had to audition with scripts and they were all absolutely brilliant. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Someone's just asked a really good question that what would death do if she, when she greets someone absolutely awful who's dying? I think the important line is from death, the high cost of living. Um, where she, oh, maybe it's from death, the high cost of the time of your life, where she says, nobody's awful on the inside. And death yeah. gets to see you, death gets to see you as you are. And, <laughs> Death gets to know who you are. And as you really are. The people who yeah. are monsters and the people who are terrible, at the end of the day, they're scared, they're foolish, they're upset. And she's there for them too. Yeah. Yeah. But also, that no one comes into this world a villain. No. You know, yeah. Everyone starts off a baby, you know, with. Yeah. And everyone means something to someone, whether you think, oh, that person's awful and I wish they... It's like that person means something to someone. They've, they, there's someone that they love. There's someone that loves them. There's someone that shows them kindness or someone that they... There's, there's or something, you know, I think there's... I don't think there's a, a person without a redeeming quality. And I think that's, that's the point, isn't it? I, I, I believe very much that when you can see the full picture, when you see the macro, you understand that. But we, as humans, we're quite small and we only see the micro. And so we bicker and we infight and we divide. But if you can see the bigger picture, if you are, you have that confident power, of course, you know, of course you can be more forgiving and accepting. That reminds me of something that Tom said about, about his... Um about his approach to, to, to dream that he has to sort of contain the subconscious and the unconscious of all of humanity. And it, it's so huge that he has to hold it at a level that's sort of in his bowels almost, because if it were any higher up, then he couldn't continue existing. Yeah. It's too big. I love, I love that you get to be Franklin's death, Kirby. Yeah. And in the same way that the Franklin of the first comic was, yeah. you know, a 16-year-old kid and he got 16-year-old white boy and he got a 16-year-old white girl as his death. <laughs> you get to be that Franklin's death. Yeah. Yeah. I love that his outfit is that. even the same as the comic. It's amazing. <clears throat> I love that guy. And there's our beautiful old inn. This is where Dream accidentally goes into Ted Lasso. That place was absolutely stunning. And actually, it was lean. It, the, the root, it, it was an in, incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I took a lot of right. photos, but none of the photos take it, do any justice whatsoever. Hello. <laughs> Absolutely never worn anything like that in my entire life. It was fantastic. I have some good uh, behind the scenes photos of you that morning, Kirby, coming out of wardrobe. Oh. <laughs> that was how I met you, I think. I was living, I, I, it was fantastic. I was, what a great start to the shoot, truly. I love this so much. I love the goats. I love everything about this, except I wish I could go back in time and point out 
to whoever was in charge of props that nobody was going to have clay pipes for another 300 years. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> and just so people know, this all of the in sequences about the, were shot um, in sequence as well. The people yeah. with yes. tiny parts. Yeah. Ama amazing well, actors, all of them. With tiny parts being vastly qualified is true. They were absolutely sensational actors with like half a line. I loved I loved writing all of that background dialogue that just repeats and repeats and repeats through the centuries. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love how the joke uh, evolves and changes. I think what's stunning about the costumes in this, actually, that I found really interesting is that a lot of the it's very it, this is a very hard period to find costumes because it it's not documented in the same way and i was talking to sarah about it and a lot of the things that we did document uh what, what the aristocracy wore what rich people so it's hard to find sort of like what the everyday man wore mm. and so they did such an incredible job here nice beard Ferdy. I this this Hob Gadlin, thirty years, so amazing. This changed my. I think I was always that person that you know, people say, "Would you want to live forever?" And you think about who all the people you would lose instead of the other. And actually, in speaking with my boyfriend, he's so much like. Think about how much you could actually see, how much you could experience. And his, this episode changed my thinking on, I mean, I'd love to see where we are in hundreds of years. We've come this far. Oh man, I've been talking for about half an hour. Muted. I'm here. No, we heard you. Oh, good. I love the Someone... implied 100 years that's going to turn up now as Hobbes slowly discovers that. He isn't getting old and he isn't dying yeah. and you got a whole <laughs> yeah. story. Someone said uh, in the chat, we, uh, we're, we are all Hob and I, and I, I, I think we are all Hob. It's a good t-shirt. So that, if I, if I recently unmuted myself, um, then I, then I should probably repeat the uh, nonsense I was just saying about this in a way being the, the simplest acting job I've had, which is a joy because you, um, you're always just trying to ask yourself, what would I do if I were this person then, there, in that situation? And uh, it's kind of what Hob boils down to in every moment. He's, uh, he's, he's living in the moment and he's a, he's a product of his time. He's absolutely a product of his time. Of every time he, he lives in, he's a product of his time. Like, I think, like all of us. First time I'd shaved in two years. Thank you, COVID-19. <laughs> Ferdy, is this the most hair and makeup and costume changes you've ever done in a show in a single episode? Yeah, but kind of, but ha having a lot of hair and a beard is kind of my special skill. So it, I've, I've never <laughs> felt more useful to a show. <laughs> but we got to map it out, which is brilliant. There's a spreadsheet I've got somewhere. 
um, on my phone of us trying to work out what I'd have when, what would be um, extensions, what would be model zone. It was brilliant. Me and Anne Fenton, it was great. Kim Nees. It's a simple pleasure, isn't it? Wouldn't come for centuries. <laughs> yeah. Well, so when, you know, when the camera was cut, this was kind of, the, the, the conversation just carried on, basically. Me getting to know Tom, just sitting there working out who each other was, which is kind of what our entire relationship in the show is about, just working out who the other one is, really. I had such a similar experience. I think that's the beauty of this episode. It was so still and so contemplative that you couldn't help but continue. The, it, you couldn't just stop these conversations when they said cut. You you were sort of, you wanted to know much more about the person. Like, Tom, if you could, would you really stay alive forever? You know, like, it prompted so many more. It was yeah, like, you just this, sort of, you stop saying the script, but you just carry on yeah. chuntering away in the moment. It's this episode, I think, is a great date episode. You should watch it on a date because it's a great icebreaker. You can find out a lot about your <laughs> potential partner. Yep. From There's the a lot of what would you this... do questions, aren't there? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Note, by the way, that all William the Shakespeare and Marlowe dialogue is in iambic pentameter. Do you know, Neil, it took me about 15 years to realise that. <laughs> Which is weird, considering I'm from Stratford upon Avon and I only speak in iambic pentameter. <laughs> Look like my dad. I love that we're all shut up and we're just watching. Yeah. I was thinking about Maisie, the director, who um, who had a, a lot to juggle, but she's just zero in on uh, what these two people were asking of each other. She's She was absolutely brilliant. She was incredibly yeah, was prepared. Goes. Some date this one. <clears throat> yeah. I kind of feel about Sam what Hobb feels about Shakespeare because he went to the same drama school as me and is doing worryingly well. So obviously I hate him. <laughs> I, I first got to work with him on Ocean at the End of the Lane and I suggested him when oh, we auditioned of dozens of Shakespeare's and all of them were posh boys and all of them were <laughs> very, very puffed up with the idea of having played Shakespeare. So, uh, yeah. So we asked Sam, and he aced the audition. Yeah, I mean, he's he can really do it. It's annoying. I hate it when other people are good at acting. <laughs> yeah, it's like when your date just walks out on you and goes to goes to talk to the people yeah. at the next table. Yeah, not going to speak to him for another hundred years. Thanks for that, Alan. It actually broke my heart realizing what this scene must have felt like from Hobbes' point of view, yeah. reading the comic. Just, well, just leaves the date. Yeah. Seasons two and three right here. <clears throat> <laughs> I must destroy. <laughs> there we go. 
I am big pentameter. <laughs> it must be like just sort of watching your date walk off with somebody with the person at the next <laughs> yeah. table. They head off together. Yeah. And you realise that the food's worth sticking around for. Yeah. So I have to give a shout out to our editor, Shoshana Tanzer, who uh, is responsible for all of this gorgeous brilliance. That is a really good cut. Yeah. Can I give a little shout out to the to the uh, um, well to the the design and props department with these oh. absolutely bonkers sets that they built. We sort of had two two pubs back to back, didn't we? And we'd be shooting on one while they were dressing the other one for the next century. And it was um it was cr absolutely bonkers walking on you know three days later and going we moved on a hundred years. Yes, the crew were, we would. Yeah, the crew were like nothing other teams. We would alternate so that we would be shooting dream and death outside while they were transforming mm. the pub on the inside. I'm telling you, this is the ultimate icebreaker episode. I have literally thought about like, what would I do? How would I change my identity? Would I, where would I move? What if you, like, re what if you reached if you reach this point? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the, the this one is of the panels in the comics uh, uh, around you know the next thirty seconds, which I kind of went back to every day, which is you know the obvious thing coming up this bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the essence of Hob, basically. Yeah. And, I uh, that's everything about Hob. That, but I can see I, I, Hob spike. I can. That's everything. Uh, there's always tomorrow, isn't there? And um, I can see his little spiky, <clears throat> pen-drawn beard in my mind, and I could see it every day, and that was my that was my hook. I think that's one of the most compassionate lines, uh, maybe that I've ever. Yeah. seen written or, or because I think that you we look you can look at people who are have fallen on hard times and feel so bad but but you don't know like we all have so much to live for there's so much that we don't know and circumstances can change so quickly to yeah. for, for that man to say no I still have so much to live for I think it's yeah. unbelievably yeah. if there's if there's enough of a, of, a, and... of a fraction of your all that wants to wants to carry on then yeah. Carry on. Right? Uh, yeah, just slightly more complicated um, relationship with this century, Hob. Thank you very much. Again, one of those awful moments where he's a person of his times and dream. I love that. Line. To tell him exactly what he's. Incredible thinks. line. Yeah. Alan, do you remember we talked about this a lot? How how um how far into it we could commit ourselves and whether we could um whether we could still want to spend time with Hob at all after a scene like this and the and the, the, the you know, the toing and froing that we did to, to find a, a balance of someone who's done something awful and can never um, make up for it, but can st still try and find a life after. I mean, as we learn, in some way as we learn from Sandman, it becomes something that haunts Hob. It becomes a thing that he can never quite atone for. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. To the, to the, to the very, 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 very end. <laughs> yeah.
I love the way Tom says the choice is yours. It's brilliant. And here comes Jenna Coleman <clears throat> as Lady Joanna Constantine. Hi, mate. Speaking of transformations, Jenna, I mean, she goes she from like... doesn't go with my shtick. Me, you know, kind of booze up and to this is incredible. Yeah. So dignified. A line that I took enormous joy in putting back in. I think that was... <laughs> That was the only thing I changed in the whole strip. I know. I remember when the draft came through and that was back in. Was that you? When that when it came, that was it was me. back in, and I nearly cheered because it's the um, it's, prob it's probably the mistake that people have made about me for most of my life. So it makes sense. And of course, now we get to remember that Hob really was a bandit, a mercenary, and you don't live. Yeah. Over 400 years without learning a few skills for survival. <laughs> mm -hmm. On the other hand, Lady Joanna is a nasty, dangerous piece of work. You don't <laughs> want to mess with her. Oh, yeah. Sand power. Bye. I really felt like Hob in this moment because I hadn't been there for the rest of the series. <laughs> from experience. Yeah. I love those Very transitions. Good cut. Yes. Shoshana with a little help from me and Mark Witz and VFX. This really was four in the morning. Sorry about that, Ferdy. <laughs> it's not a bad job. She comes from Henry Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor, does Lushing Lou. Real person. Does she? I've all heard yes. about Lushing Lou. How did you get that line in there? <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's it's all that's all from um, the uh, books of Victorian slang. It was wow, proper Victorian slang. I will those say Victorian those auditions. Disgusting. Those auditions were particularly painful. <laughs> the the quick bum dance, line especially. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Sorry, I was not hear me chewing. Nice try, mate.
The greatest insult you can ever say to somebody. You seem terrified. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> emotionally constipated. I I think Tom was really ready to push over that table like he did in the comic. Yeah. I've um, I've never worked with someone else who can uh, never raise their voice and have that much of an impact on you in a scene with them. Well, that's why I didn't feel like he should turn the table over, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Genius music cue. Thank you. My favorite. I'm particularly proud this of This was one. when we shot it and when I did ADR. This this was um, Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears. I had to change so it. You see I, my foot tapping at the puppets that. to uh, do that. I get it. I get it. You just know exactly think this where works you were. It's a good replacement. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this works perfectly. Just happens to be because everybody wants to rule the so. world is timeless in this. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like not specific to a nineteen eighty nine. It's 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 been used. It doesn't put a you lot. in this year, yeah. does it? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't place you. Yeah, but this is so so specific. And now yeah. you get to this be dressed just, just like in. the Corinthian was in nineteen eighty nine. Mm. Oh, look at that! In the original, comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he yeah, was a little bit of much like I Corinthian now. style. And there's lovely Ian McNeese. Nisi. And this is the first real departure from the uh, from the comic, isn't it? Yeah. I remember I Alan and I just sort of talking this stuff mm -hmm. through. And... That's funny because I, I worked with Ian on Foundation and and I, I think he might have left my set to go do this. Like literally the next day or two. No, he's wonderful. I wanted to cast him because in 1996, and he did a read through of Neverwhere for me and uh, was one of the people at the, the full the full reading. And at the oh, end, Neverwhere. he said, well, of course, you're never going to cast me for anything. Huh. So I thought one day, you know, one day I will cast you for something. This show has a lot of really lovely Yeah, and he's related stories. to Tom, and Tom didn't even know he was there until he saw the call sheet. Oh, oh wow. Oh, my gosh. That's lovely. I like the fact that Hob is planning at this point. Yeah, he's got to play the long game at this point, hasn't he? Yeah. Another really, really good transition. Yeah. Beautiful. And beautiful triple transition there. Mm. Shoshana. Yes. Beautiful job. Well done, Shoshana.
I remember there was a point where we were talking about the idea of doing, getting this all exciting and having Hob being captured and Death having to rescue him and all sorts of stuff. And I'm so glad we didn't do any of that stuff. It's uh, He was going to be kidnapped and... Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes yeah, there he is marking... But do you remember this, there was a whole... Um, for kids. There, was a, there was a version where this was... Um, do you remember Hob teaching, doing a lecture, yeah. Alan? Yeah, I wrote that scene I, where he's you know, actually my massive, telling my massive the ego when you sent me. Yeah, my enormous <laughs> ego when you sent this uh, <laughs> this one line version through. I was like, I like to say words, and then of course I, we did it. I was like, this. Is I love that scene. Classic. It was like here's, here's everything Hob has learned, like over the last seven hundred years in one speech, yeah. and then we cut it. Yeah. God, this is fantastic. And there there is Desire's heart. Mason's amazing. It's a real set that that, uh, Gary Steele designed. (sighs) And there's the mirror. People have asked me what that weird bird skull is in the background, and it's a representation of Dream's Helm, at least the one... In Desire's world. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's got a bit of, it's got that kind of a, it, it's a representation, but it's got that Plague Doctor thing, hasn't um, it? The, the, yeah. So, yeah. And there is a lovely, lovely, yeah. lovely Abe McKean thing, but it appeared and vanished very quickly. If ever <laughs> any of you out there... What Dave's um, credits? Yeah, watch the yeah. whole of the credits, because watch they the have credits. these beautiful Dave McKean end credit animation things sometimes you you may need to actually slip into your settings and uh turn off the um next episode the the auto play next episode thing in order to be able to watch them but but then be sure um, to watch the next episode after you (laughs) should we just do episode seven seven now Uh, okay well you i have to tell you You've you've totally spoiled me. Now I want you all in my room for every episode. Uh, listen, d- your insights and your comments uh, were so uh, illuminating. I mean, because I watch this and I think, how do they do this? I mean, I, I know there's practical sets, but the way you created hell was astonishing the the cgi i mean i i was wondering uh how much of it was green screen how much of it was practical but um and in addition to actors like gwendolyn christie and uh uh stephen fry and david thulis and john cameron mitchell who i've known and loved for years Mm. it's just amazingly cast you said that those actors that didn't have any lines had to audition. Everyone was superb. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. amazing. And uh, Thank you. I mean, that's well, down to Lucinda Sison and Natasha Vincent, our casting directors, who this was a massive, there's like 380 speaking parts. You know, uh, it, it was just an enormous undertaking and they were incredible. Incredible. Yeah, it's epic in scope. And uh, like I say, every actor is, is, I mean, I'd never seen Tom Sturridge before, but he was a revelation. Uh, and, you know, Kirby and Ferdinand, kudos. Wow. What, what, what an accomplishment. Well, you, you can talk, that, Mark. You're my hero. I think you're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Well, listen, I mean, this should go right at the top of your resume. And I know you have amazing careers ahead of you. So uh, wow. congratulations. Uh, I feel sort of awkward because <laughs> uh, my connection to the series is is so tentative. I mean, uh, I, I loved... Uh, no, I love playing Merv, and I have to say that I went in not knowing anything. Neil was there to guide me. Uh, remind me who else was there, because I had no uh, preconceptions. Alan, it, was, it was me, Alan, and Andrew Charlton, our amazing um, post-producer, the three of us. Okay. And, because uh, 
I brought in no preconceptions and then listened to what you said. And uh, uh, hopefully it turned out the way you wanted it. But th- it was this perfect. was wonderful. Well, you this are is one of the, the finest talking pumpkin who has ever I, uh, graced the screen as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and my goal is to just corner the market on all future <laughs> pumpkin head roles. <laughs> It was the role I was born to play. Uh, Listen, thank you all so, so very much. And I mean that. I would give anything to have you through all 11 episodes because it's riveting. It's it's just the kind of thing that uh, um, I wanted to know. I mean, because you watch it, it's so immersive and you're so in that world. And then when it's over, you're just thinking, how did they do that? How did they do this? What were they trying to accomplish with that? Um, So, you know, to have it annotated by the creators and the artists involved was truly a dream come true. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Mark. Amazing to have you. Thank you, Mark. And any any final magic of what we do, isn't it? That you see your bits and it's just... yeah. Well, I just yeah, wanted to, I mean, to say this, what you were saying, Mark. That 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 the, the magic of what we do is that you get to uh, you do your little bit, and and then you wait for a year, and right. uh, and you see what the hundreds and hundreds of other people have put their their heart and soul into. You you contribute to make you look your half decent. You contribute your little jigsaw puzzle piece, mm-hmm. and then wait to see how yeah. they assemble this massive puzzle but uh i'm telling you I, it, I, it, it still feels like magic to me well good i don't see <laughs> how it could be anything but i mean and you don't want to become jaded uh but this is unlike anything i've ever seen before it's truly a masterpiece in my eyes and uh, i'm so grateful for for not only for the the, the show itself but uh, to, to to be able to listen to your insights on how it was done and why it was done. So again, uh, I thank you all, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much. much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you, to thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, pleasure. everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, there's loads of you watching. Thousands it's amazing. You. Thank you so wow. much. This is so cool. Thank you for tuning in. Cheers, guys. All right, then. Have a happy day. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Figure out how to turn it off. Bye-bye. Bye now.